The world isn't a perfect place. In previous contemplations I have presented my realization, which is only worth as much as that, that the world is a dream place for therapy. Granted, it is a very vivid dream, a full, seemingly all-encompassing reality, but nevertheless a dream. In it, a constant conflict between the imperfections of our fallen core beings and their cast reflections, or shadows as I prefer to call them, is continuous. As also contemplated previously, the purpose of this war is not to be fought and won, but to serve as a presentation of contrasts, so that, from the observation of such contrasting reflections, our redemption can be attained through glimpses of realization. It becomes imperative then, from that point of view, to understand that the quality of the shadows is directly linked with the quality of our accepted and normalized imperfections, that is, in other words, directly linked with the quality of our fallen state or state of sin. Examples of this can be easily seen when we look back even upon our lifetimes and our parents' lifetimes. They accepted, as did we, the gradual normalization of a sensation of secured contentment in exchange for forfeiting not only pieces of self-sovereignty, but also in exchange for a materialistic mindset about the world itself. Of course, that acceptance of materialism itself came also as a contrasting reflection to previous false and abusive spirituality. The pendulum, like a metronome, goes from one extreme to the other continuously, even though it loses momentum and stretch at every movement until there is very little visible difference and contrast between the two extremes and eventually the pendulum stops shortly after. The mentioned acceptance of gradual normalization of secured contentment revealed our identification with our mind characters that are but constructs with no life of their own, for if one is willing to accept temptation that means that one still holds some identification with what one is being tempted with, thus showing a significant aspect of our particular fallen state. For instance, if one is tempted to take wrathful revenge on evildoers for having used their given power to attack our identified contentments, then one is vulnerable to wrath, which generates that tone of reflection or shadow. Metaphorically, this is another swing of the metronome pendulum in the opposite direction. One must understand that, at its basis, the secured contentment is a feeling that induces the generalized mental sensation that the only purpose or pursuit available in this world is a definition of the word happiness, curiously usually linked with the word dream and this was used by both sides. As you probably know by now, one of the first shared realizations on this channel was truth speaks no words, exactly because words are trapped, catalogued essence that cover and muffle life by framing it within such boundaries of accepted definitions. A word, then, albeit necessary for communication, should never be mistaken for a representative of an aspect of truth, even if it is our living aspects of truth, or essences, that blindly give words too much power. For instance, apart from happiness and dream, we have been also willingly chained by words such as rights and freedom. So much so that there are individuals who are willing to fight the war and die for them. But when one realizes that this war is the same war that has always been ongoing in the dream realm, that is, the war between our fallen essences and their shadow reflections, then one understands that there is no possible victory through conflict. As winning there means merely a switch of positions on the same chessboard. 
the oppressed become the oppressor, who will also pursue their enemies, and, in time, inevitably personifies the shadows they fought against. He who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. When you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Nietzsche accurately observed in this instance. Or also the previously quoted ending segment of The Grey Monk by William Blake. But vain the sword and vain the bow, they never can work war's overthrow. The hermit's prayer and the widow's tear alone can free the world from fear. For a tear is an intellectual thing, and a sigh is the sword of an angel king, and the bitter groan of the martyr's woe is an arrow from the Almighty's bow. The hand of vengeance found the bed to which the purple tyrant fled. The iron hand crushed the tyrant's head and became a tyrant in his stead. So, as also contemplated previously in The Middle, fighting in the war, be it against the monsters or on their side, will bring no solution. At most, it may bring a respite. However, the cost of that interval is a reinforcement of the core identification with the object that the war was fought about, usually words and their concepts, causing that the victor becomes inevitably what he fought against and also inevitably causing a new rebellion against them that, in time, will also be victorious in the war. Again, it is like the pendulum of a metronome and applying power to push it to one side will merely cause it, in time, to come back to its opposite side, inevitably. We are essences of life and truth that have no inherent connection to any of the sides of the eternal conflict. Note that eternal means while time lasts, not beyond time itself. The only connection we can get to any of the sides is through temptation. Nevertheless, when we observe the conflict by attempting to be in the middle point, we see that there are, on both sides, cheap copies, for lack of a better term, of truth. Fragments that have been framed into words and concepts, and smudged enough to fit the imperfect dream realm and our minds in it. So, being in the realm we have to work with what we have. On the one hand, we understand that we have to be in the world as observers. But on the other, we also understand that we are not from the world. And so we aim at atonement and redemption. And that atonement and redemption comes exactly from observing the world and its conflict without getting invested in it. Because we know that this is not our home. We are, essentially, both the patient and the therapist in this dream realm, whose sole purpose is to rescue us from our own fallen state through the observation of the eternal war in it, that reflects the eternal war in us. To pursue a word such as happiness is not to be happy at one's core. To pursue a word such as dream is to not be awake in our minds. Does this mean that we should just sit and do nothing? Of course not. That would again be the metronome pendulum way of thinking, of going from one extreme to the other. What the realization means, in my view, is that whatever we do, and we do have to do things in the realm, we should do it as integral aspects of contemplation, observation, and realization, always bearing in mind and soul that others are also being placed under the same therapy or test. Help them freely when possible, but do not force anything, for they have to realize themselves and force merely again pushes their individual pendulum too. 
We are in this realm constrained to have to wear mental characters that, one way or another, use language as well as other tools, such as the ones we're using now, computers and internet and so on. That being the case, aim to wear a character on your ego that resembles as much as possible what you have so far realized your true essence to be. Expect failure in that and accept it. After all, purity and perfection are neither expected nor possible here. Yet, through that aim and moral focus, one is gradually transmuted back into alignment with that essence. That is, metaphorically, be your father's son. Go back, after having been the prodigal son that wasted away in the vain pursuits of so many irrelevant personas that were worn and identified with over who knows how many lifetimes, and return home to your original father with no more pride nor shame. Life and truth is always waiting to embrace us back, but it is we that needed and wanted to go through the therapy in the dream world. And also, if you see one being embraced, refuse the prideful temptation of being like the older brother, if you never got to roam the world and be wasteful, because that is the same pride with which the younger set off. Luke 15, 11 to 32. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look! All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. <laughs>